I have always believed that the piety is of all the virtues, not only the one of which possession is most pure, but also the one where the pleasure is most gentle for mortals. It is piety which constitutes the happiness of power, and which makes its use enviable. I resolved to consecrate this place to the erection of seats for all the gods alike, in order not only to rise there in the memory of my ancestors' monuments which you see, but also so that devout people dedicated to superior spirits will constantly have before their eyes, as a witness of my piety, this same place where they will have the same feelings. It is thus why I have erected these statues in divine forms. Antiochus the first of Kamajin, first century B.C. The Roman troops began their advance toward the east in the 2nd century BC and continued it at the start of the 1st century AD. The main successor to Alexander the Great's dominion in the east, the Seleucid state, had lost its erstwhile power. The Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt the other successor of Alexander the Great had also lost its former might. In their place, the Pontic and Parthian kingdoms had gained power. In northern Near East, the kingdom of Greater Armenia continued to remain a powerful state. Tigran the Great became king of Greater Armenia in 95 BC, achieved unprecedented successes in a 25-year period. He carried out victorious invasions to the depths of Asia Minor, conquered Georgia and Caucasian Albania, located north of Armenia, and subjected the Parthian kingdom to his hegemony, also stripping from them the title of King of Kings. He ruled over the northern region of Mesopotamia and Kamajin, the entire region to the east of the Mediterranean Sea, Cilicia, the Seleucid state, Phoenicia, Judea, and the kingdom of Nabatheas, which supplied him with his troops in times of war. But the Lomé XII came to power in Egypt with the aid of troops furnished by Tigran the Great. In this way, the Armenian king Tigran the Great became the most powerful ruler in the Near East. In 71 BC, Rome defeated the Pontic king Mithridates Eupator, who fled to Armenia and took refuge with his ally, Tigran the Great. The Romans demanded that Mithridates Eupator be turned over to them, but the Armenian emperor refused them. Thus, war was inevitable between the two superpowers, one in the east and the other in the west. The Romans then prepared for war.
It was in this tense political atmosphere that Antiochus I ascended the throne of the little kingdom of Kamajim, tucked away in the Armenian or Eastern Taurus Mountains in 70 BC. It fell to Antiochus I's lot to build numerous grand edifices, among which was the sanctuary on Mount Nemrut in Kamajin, one of the world's most enigmatic monuments, which is still admired to this day. Mount Nemrut is located in the Armenian or Eastern Taurus mountain range. It is the highest peak in the country of Kamajin. Nemrut is the second mountain with the same name in the Armenian highlands. The first, Great Nemrut, is located west of Lake Van and is associated with Haik, the ancestor god from whom the Armenians derived their name. In the ancient Armenian mythology, Haik was worshipped as the supreme god. The Armenians called the constellation Orion by his name. Haik was subsequently replaced by the supreme god of Armenian mythology, Aramaz, whose cult worship also occupied a central position in the sanctuary of Mount Nemrut in Kamajin. Incidentally, whereas the name Nemrut is found twice in the Armenian mountain range, Kamak Kamajin appears three times. The first is the Kamak Kamajin of the Armenian Taurus Mountains. The second, the Kamak located in the sources of the western Euphrates River, which was the main center of the Aramaz cult worship in the kingdom of Greater Armenia. The third in turn is located in the vicinity of Great Nemrut Mountain. All three of them are linked to the worship of the supreme Armenian god Aramaz Oromazdes. We should also point out that the Nemrut Kamak pair occurs only twice on Earth. One is in the Armenian Taurus Mountains, the other west of Lake Van. Both of them are in the Armenian Highlands. Such a sanctuary cluster of monuments as this does not exist either in the Armenian Highlands or generally speaking in the history of the ancient world, and it is one of the largest. Perhaps a parallel can be drawn between it and the culture of Persepolis, or the Egyptian pyramids. What is this monument cluster or this sanctuary architecturally speaking? It is an artificially constructed cone on a previously selected summit, i.e. the peak, artificially emphasized, has been elevated upwards to the extent possible with the cone, and a road has been created in the circular base of the cone, which goes around the entire cone and on three of whose sides are fixed certain sub-monument groups. According to notions of ancient mythology, following the creation, the order of the universe is maintained owing to the universal mountain. In ancient times, people were convinced that the remains of their ancestors made their fatherland sacred, their souls in turn rising to divine realms, reinforced the sacred mountain maintaining the cosmic order. Perhaps that is the reason why the tombs of great men were built in the shape of a cone or pyramid, which was the distinctive symbol of the universal mountain. Here, my body, after having aged in the midst of these blessings, will sleep in eternal rest, separated from the pious soul flying off towards the celestial regions of Sus Oromazdes. Antiochus of Kamajin.
This construction, per se, is extremely important as a category, independent of whether this is a case of tomb or pantheon, or any given monument in general. The reason is that there is perhaps the prototype of this in the Armenian highlands, fixed in the 3rd millennium BC, appearing as round burials. The issue at hand is that this represents the concept of royal pantheon, pertaining directly to the phenomenon of realization of statehood, which naturally leads to its largeness of scale, its monumentality. This sanctuary also hints at the nature of the monuments in the Armenian highlands, generally speaking, which belong to the Armenian culture that would be linked to polytheism. These are the tombs from the eastern regions of Armenia, Artsakh and Zunik, dating back to the 3rd and 2nd millennia BC. These tombs, which were built two, three millennia before the Nemrut sanctuary, are the prototypes of the tomb built by Antiochus I in all their characteristics. The only difference is in their sizes. The mound of tombs at Nemrut is 50 meters high, while its prototypes built millennia beforehand are 10 to 12 meters high. The monument of Nemrut, of course, is far from being just a tomb. It is the great sanctuary of the royal family, the witness to the divinity of the king and his ancestors. It was built on the highest point of the kingdom, at an elevation of 2100 meters, from stones brought from another place besides. The cone-shaped artificial mound of tombs was built with small stones, without mortar. It has a height of 50 meters, i.e. a present-day 17-story building, and it hasn't crumbled throughout the ensuing millennia. It is extremely difficult even at the present time to achieve a structure of such complexity with exceptional engineering calculation. Erected on two sides of the hill, eastern and western, are identical groups of statues which depict the gods, the king and his ancestors, the kingdom's coats of arms, lion and eagle, as well as the king's horoscope with the sculpture of a lion. In modern times, people became aware of the sanctuary of Nemrut through the book entitled Travels in Asia Minor in Northern Syria by the German archeologist Karl Humann and Otto Puchstein, published in Berlin in 1890. These are photographs taken at the end of the 19th century. In this photograph, the head of the statue of the mother goddess is still in place. An important addition to the work of these 19th century German archeologists was made in the middle of the 20th century by an American German archeological expedition the results of which were published by Therese Gull and Carl Friedrich Derner. The study of the sanctuary continued in subsequent decades, and new results and interpretations are expected presently too. Numerous scientists rightfully consider this sanctuary, which was created more than 2,000 years ago, and can be compared only with the Egyptian pyramids in terms of the complexity of its construction as the eighth wonder of the ancient world. Kamajin is a territory in the southwestern part of the Armenian highlands. Kamajin is the Greek name for this territory. It is known variously as Kamak, Kamakha, or Kumuk in ancient Assyrian, Hittite Luvian 
and Armenian sources. The earliest mentions of the land of Kamajin Kamak are preserved in written sources starting from the second millennium BC. At the beginning of the first millennium BC, this small kingdom got caught in the rivalry between Assyria and Urartu, or the Araratian kingdom, and naturally allied itself with the latter, with which it had ties of kinship. Starting at the end of the 7th century BC, the territory of Kamajin became part of the Armenian Orontid Yervanduni Kingdom. The Orontid Yervanduni royal family ruled in Armenia for centuries uninterruptedly. Moreover, Antiochus I of Kamajin also belonged to that dynasty. What we know about the genealogy of Antiochus I is based on the inscriptions left by him in the sanctuary on Mount Nemrut, as well as the bas-relief sculpted there, presenting his ancestors in two rows, each of which contains 15 stone slabs. On one side is the paternal line, with the maternal line on the other. Antiochus I begins the series of ancestors in the paternal line with Darius I, while those in the maternal line start with Alexander the Great. Here we are dealing with a phenomenon which has been widespread in all ages, the presentation by kings of a genealogy that is extremely honorable for them, which sometimes didn't correspond to reality. In the first century BC, the kings of not only Camagene, but also neighboring Cappadocia and Pontus claimed that their genealogy stemmed from the Achaemenid king Darius I and Alexander the Great. There were many manifestations of this phenomenon in subsequent centuries as well. For example, many dynasties in the Christian world tried to link their origin to Jesus Christ or the Jewish king David, although in reality, they did not have any connection with the Jewish environment. The question arises as to why and how the Antiochus of Camagene came forth with such genealogy. His mother, Queen Laodice, was the king's daughter or princess. Therefore, she traced her ancestry on her mother's side to General Seleucus Nicator of Macedonia, and from him to Alexander the Great, even though there were no ties of blood between them. In order to trace his lineage to Darius I on his father's side, Antiochus of Camagen committed an infraction of the accepted rule. That's why he used the fact of the marriage of Orontas Aroan de Zirvand, one of his paternal ancestors, to Rhodogene, the daughter of Artaxerxes II, one of the successors to Darius I. King Yervand succeeded the governor Yervand. This is Yervand III, who led the Armenian troops in the battle of Gaugamela, and having distinguished himself in that battle, proceeded to declare Armenia as independent. Mentioned thereafter in the series of Antiochus's ancestors, which unfortunately hasn't been preserved in its entirety, is the Armenian king Samos, who built Samosat, the center of Kamajin. Mentioned next is Arsham, who built Arshamashat, as well as two cities named Arsameya in Kamajin, and who was a rather powerful sovereign. In other words, all these inscriptions uniformly attest to the fact that Antiochus I was the direct heir of the Armenian Orontid Yervanduni royal house.
Antiochus I was declared king of Kamajin in 70 BC and crowned by Tigran the Great with the crown that received the name Arminian or Tigranian. He and his successors continued to wear the Arminian or Tigranian crown, thereby underscoring their Arminian identity in a distinctive way. The Arminian or Tigranian crown also appears on Roman coins as a symbol of the Arminian kingdom. Such coins were issued by Mark Anthony in 34 BC and later on by Augustus Octavian. The Arminian kingdom of Kamajin existed until 72 AD when it was destroyed by the Roman Emperor Vespasian. Of significance is the fact that the Tigranian or Arminian crown continued to be stamped on the coins of the Kamajin kingdom until its fall. Besides being a magnificent architectural monument, the Sanctuary of Nemrut is an important primary source for the study of ancient faith, particularly the pre-Christian religion of the Armenians. There are five anthropomorphic statues in a sitting position among the central constructions of the group of monuments. In the center is the statue of Aramazuz, which is nine meters in height, expressed in contemporary measure, that is the height of a three-story building. In Armenian mythology, Aramaz Oromazdez Zuz was revered as the creator of heaven and earth, the father of the gods giver of courage and abundance to mankind, and fertility to the earth. The statues of the other gods were somewhat smaller, eight meters high. On the right side of Aramazuiz is the statue of the mother goddess, who was considered from ancient times as the goddess of war, the protector of the land and the capital city, the gracious patroness, the glory and nourisher of the earth. She was revered with the title Golden Mother. On the other side of Aramazus is the statue of Mithra Apollo Helios, the god of life giving light, the sun and justice. These three central statues represent the three supreme gods at the head of Armenian mythological figures. Later on, the functions of the supreme Indo-European trio were combined in the worship of the Holy Trinity, and it is not accidental that Christianity became more widespread in the Indo-European world. Moreover, being accepted for the first time by the Armenians on the state level. Represented on one side of the three supreme gods is King Antiochus I himself, the builder of the sanctuary. On the other side, Artagnes Hercules Vahagen, the god of courage. Among the Greeks, Hercules was considered the demigod, symbolizing courage. In Kamajin, Artagnes was a bona fide god in the neighboring and related kingdom of Greater Armenia. Bahagin Artagnes was not only a bona fide god, but also his cult was merged with Mirmitra, the sun god, and he had become the third member of the supreme trio governing the family of gods and goddesses. This is how the king of Greater Armenia greeted his people in pre-Christian times. 
to the magnates, the nobles, the princesses, the officials and other men under my authority, to everyone together greeting. May there, by greeting and prosperity, by the help of the gods, abundant fertility from noble Aramaz, protection from Lady Anahit, barrier from Valiant, Bahag, to all our land of Armenia. Agatha Angelos, History of Armenia. The shaking of hands by Antiochos I and the gods is represented in a few of the monuments of Nemrut Sanctuary. According to ancient esoteric teachings, they not only symbolize the receipt of authority from the gods, but also the distinctive alliance with them. According to that alliance, the divine blessings received from the celestial realms had to be returned to them at the final hour of terrestrial life. Moreover, the mission of Antiochus I was not limited to the performance of works typical of human beings. He appears as a god incarnated on earth. The great the king, king Antiochus, Antiochus, the god, the, god, the, righteous, the righteous, the manifested, the manifested god, god, the friend, the friend of the Romans, Romans and the Greeks, and the, Greeks the, son the son of king Mithridates Kalinikos and of and queen, queen Laodice. Laodice. Manifested God. It becomes apparent from this title that we are dealing with the creed of Epiphany, which is characteristic of the Mithraic theology. King Antiochus appears as the earthly embodiment of the sun god Mithra Apollo Helios, as the revealed incarnate god. And it is the very Mithraic theology that helps us to understand the entire essence of Antiochus I. Mir Mithra is the god of creation. He was born of rock. That occurred in ancient times, in the times of pre-beginning, pre-creation. That was the time when time as such didn't exist. The world, in turn, was nothing but a salty sea, out of which a rocky cliff sharply rose. The moment came when the sky was rent, and a beam of light fell on the cliff, split the cliff open, and impregnated it. A short time later, Mirmitra, the god of creation, was born from that cliff. He was born naked, but the remarkable thing was that he was wearing a hat, which scholars call a Frisian, sometimes also Armenian hat. In his right hand was a dagger, in his left hand, the burning torch of that youngster, with which he illuminated this world for the first time. Darkness retreated, and light was shed throughout the world. Three shepherds had long been awaiting the birth of Mir, the epiphany of Mir Mitra. According to the Mithraic theology, 
Mirmitra went through seven stages of sacrifice, the most important of which, the critical one having been the seventh, the killing of the bull symbolizing chaos. Killing the monstrous bull, Mirmitra created the world from its body parts and established divine law on earth. Thus he illuminated the universe, created the world, and established divine order in law there. The ancients were convinced that each year after making its revolution got worn out and came to an end. Thereafter, it had to be restored and renewed. It was envisaged to hold a special ritual for that. The pivotal operation of this ritual was the slaughter of the bull and its sacrifice. Through this ritual, the king repeated Mirmitra's feet, carrying out a new distinctive act of creation, which was perceived as the renewal of the universal order, the re-establishment of divine law on earth. This took place once a year on Avno 16. Avno 16 corresponded to December 25th. It is appropriate to mention here that the first Armenian state mentioned in cuneiform inscriptions of Mesopotamia dating back to the 3rd millennium BC, Arata, which also included the territory of Kamajin, was called the land of sacred divine laws. More than two and a half millennia later, the sun-worshipping Armenian king of Kamajin was performing annual rituals, with the belief of preserving divine law on earth. The cult of Mirmitra spread to numerous countries of the ancient world. Its mention pertains to the Mitanni kingdom that developed in the southern part of the Armenian highlands and the northern Mesopotamia, which existed during the 16th to 13th centuries BC. The cult of Mirmitra's son in Mitanni left another important trace in world history, which is sometimes ignored. The point is that the reform of monotheism in Egypt, which is considered the first such instance in history, and which was carried out during the reign of Pharaoh Akhenaten, was an imported phenomenon. It was imported from none other place than Mitanni. For a few generations in a row, the princesses of Mitanni became the first ladies of the Egyptian pharaohs, the most famous of whom was Nefertiti, the wife of Akhenaton. Numerous historians connect the religious reform in Egypt directly to her, when the sun was proclaimed the sole god. Sun worship also had firm foundations in the Indo-European neighboring kingdoms of Armenia. The main title of the kings of the Hittite state in the second millennium BC was Solar. It is not accidental that the storm god worshipped by the Hittites, who was the prototype of Aramaz, carried a weapon that we see carved on the helmets of Aramaz and Antiochus I in the Nemrut sanctuary.
Mirmitra continued to be worshipped during the period of the kingdom of Ararat Urartu II. It is not accidental that one of the main centers of the cult of the god Kaldi was called the Gate of Mir, or Gate of Mer, near Van. The name of Kaldi, the supreme god of the Ararat Urartu kingdom, meant illuminating god, god of light. According to ancient epic, the great hero Gilgamesh traveled toward the land of immortality along the side of the Euphrates River and reached the mountains of Mashu on the southern edge of the Armenian highlands, which guarded the sun. According to Hittite sources, the sun rose from Lake Van, which is mentioned in the name Eastern Sea. In the Bible as well, two of the four rivers flowing out of the Garden of Eden are the Euphrates and the Tigris and the mountains of Ararat are mentioned as the land of the east. In reality, according to ancient Mesopotamian, Hittite, and biblical depictions, Armenia was the land of the sun, from which sunrise and sunset occurred daily. We find one of the pronounced expressions of sun worship in the Armenian calendar. It is not accidental that as early as the period of the kingdom of Ararat Urartu, the very first month was called the month of Arek, Sun. Subsequently, the first and eighth days of the month were called Areg and Mir. Manifestations of sun worship have been numerous right down to the present. Not accidentally, the most common oaths among the Americans are connected to the sun. The important fact that the pre-Christian temples of the Armenians are called Mehan, which literally means Mithraic, attests to the depth and wide dissemination of the cult of Mithra in Armenia. The Temple of Garni is one of the temples in Armenia devoted to the cult of Mir, the sun god. The 24 columns on the edge of the temple symbolize the 24 hours of the day. In world history, the archetype of this style of temples ornamented with the Peri style, a dual sloping roof, and a triangular facade is the main temple of Kaldi, evidence of which dates back to the 8th century BC. This architectural style went from Ararat Urartu to Asia Minor, from there to Greece, from Greece to Rome, and then to the rest of the world. Another interesting fact is the following. In ancient Armenian sources, including the history of Armenia by Movzes Skorinatsi, the father of Armenian historiography, the ancient name of Lake Van, Salt Sea. According to Mithraic theology, Mirchmitra was born from the rock rising up from the pre-beginning Salt Sea. Armenian legends indicate Lake Van as the abode of the sun and Mirchmer was locked up in the cave located on the shore of that lake. The spread of Mithraism throughout the Roman Empire occurred in the first century AD, coinciding with the years of the consolidation of imperial power there. The peace established between Rome and Armenia back in the 60s BC, when Gnaeus Pompeius created friendly relations with Tigran the Great, the king of Greater Armenia, and Antiochus I, king of Kamajin, must have played a significant role in that infiltration. Mithraism gradually became the official state religion in Rome and gradually became the religion of the entire Roman Empire. The 
During the third and fourth centuries, another religion, Christianity, began to become widespread. Christianity became the most serious opponent of Mithraism. However, it must not be thought that Mithraism permanently vanished. The important elements of Mithraism were adopted by Christianity. Numerous rituals, Mithra's birthday, was subsequently coupled with Christ's birthday, which as we know is likewise considered to be December 25th by the Catholic Church. Other important elements connected to theology, separate components, also pass from Mithraism to Christianity. The idea of adoration of the Mechai, the idea of Christ being born in a cave. The most important item is that Christianity inherited from Mithraism the pivotal ideas of the return of the God the Savior in the Second Coming and the Final Judgment. According to these ideas, the Savior must establish the eternal kingdom of justice on the earth. He will resurrect the just and condemn the wicked. The sanctuary of Nemrut represents a classical sun-worshipping monument. Practically the same statues are erected on both sides of the artificial hill, east and west. It's an interesting circumstance that the monuments on the eastern terrace are aligned approximately 30 degrees northward from the point of the east. Perhaps this is the point from which the sun comes out on July 7, the birthday of Antiochus I. However, Let's consider a noteworthy circumstance. If we continue in a perpendicular line from the eastern terrace, then we emerge in a direct line towards the highest point in the Armenian highlands, the apex of Mount Ararat. In other words, in a distinctive manner, this group of monuments appears to be an umbilical cord connecting Mount Ararat with the kingdom of Kamajin. Samosat, the capital city of Kamajin, has played an interesting role in Armenian history. Suffice it to merely mention that Mezrap Mashtots, the inventor of the Armenian alphabet, made his invention in the very city of Samosat in 405 AD, according to the historians Moses Korinatsi and Gazar Parpetsi. Narses the Graceful, who was Catholicos of all Armenians, mentions in one of his letters that there were still Armenian sun worshippers living in Samosat as late as the 1170s AD, who expressed the desire to enter the ranks of the Armenian Church at that time. Sun worship continued among the Armenians of Kamajin for quite some time. It's interesting that there continued to be mention of sun-worshipping Armenians in foreign sources until the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century under the name of Shamsiya, meaning those of the sun. Even after the acceptance of Christianity, Mirchmitra wasn't forgotten by the Armenians. He was one of the most important heroes of the Armenian epic. first of great Meher, was also called lion-shaped Meher. This same idea is reflected in the statues from the Roman Empire, in which Mirmitra, depicted in maturity, is represented with the face of a lion.
The second is young Meher, with whom the series of heroes with divine origin ends. However, he doesn't die. The soil of the earth filled with injustice didn't last under his feet. Therefore, he is locked up in a cave, which the Armenians call the Gate of Meher. Antiochus of Kamajin was a contemporary of two kings of Greater Armenia, Tigran the Great, from whom he received his crown, and then his son Artavas II. Artavas II, who reigned from 55 to 34 BC, was also proclaimed God during his lifetime, being identified with Mirmitra. Artavas II and his spiritual brother Antiochus of Kamajin both of whom were Mithraic kings, amazingly departed from this earth through a similar fate. They both lost their thrones in 34 BC as a result of Roman treachery. They both nobly maintained loyalty to their fatherland, refusing to be pawns of Roman tyranny. The two Armenian kings, having appeared as earthly incarnations of Mirmitra's son, departed from this world with self-sacrifice, leaving the memory of their piety and patriotism to future generations. Their memory became joined with that of Mirmitra, the departing, yet without a doubt, always returning God. Nemrut, Antiochus of Kamajin built this magnificent monument in the first century BC. With the passage of centuries, many things changed and became transfigured around this sanctuary. The worship of the Holy Trinity replaced the worship of three supreme gods. Armenia became the first state to officially accept Christianity and continued to worship the departing and returning God, the Redeemer, this time in the person of Christ. King Antiochus, who was proclaimed to be the earthly incarnation of the god Mirmitra, was forgotten for centuries, but he returned in human memory 2,000 years later, at the end of the 19th century. The god Mirmitra was never forgotten by the main people worshipping him, the Armenians. He became the hero of their epic and was confined in a cave, which is called Mirsgate, till this date. The Armenians still recite their epic today, in the belief that the divine hero locked up in that cave shall return and establish justice on this earth. The Armenians still continue to believe and wait for the return of the God of Light and Justice. I have always believed that the piety is of all the virtues, not only the one of which possession is most pure, but also the one where the pleasure is most gentle for mortals. It is piety which constitutes the happiness of power and which makes its use enviable. I resolve to consecrate this place to the erection of seats for all the gods alike, in order not only to rise there in the memory of my ancestors' monuments which you see, but also so that devout people dedicated to superior spirits will constantly have before their eyes, as a witness of my piety, this same place where they will have the same feelings. It is thus why I have erected these statues in divine forms. Antiochus I of Kamajin, 1st century B.C.